Whether you like it or not, uh, Brexit is coming back. This year has been dominated by coronavirus, but expect to hear much more of the B word in coming weeks as talks on a trade deal between the UK and the EU reach a conclusion or even collapse before the transition period ends at the end of the year. So let's get the view from the EU on how negotiations are going. We're joined by Ireland's Foreign Minister, Simon Coveney. Uh, thank you uh, very much for being uh, on the programme uh, with us. So how do you Thanks, currently rate the chances of a trade deal? Well, I think I'd sum it up by saying uh, this is very difficult, but it's also very doable. Um, and I think the consequences of not getting a trade deal and a future relationship deal, of course, which goes beyond trade, because it's, there's a whole range of other things uh, that the EU and the UK need to facilitate each other on as well. Um, the consequence of not getting a future relationship agreement in place before the end of the year, I think, is very, very significant for Britain and Ireland in particular, uh, but also uh, for a number of other EU countries as well. Um, so there is a, a real reason to get this done. Uh, we know what the obstacles are. Um, from a policy point of view, uh, they are, first of all, the EU insisting that there is fair competition between the two markets in the future, uh, what we call a level playing field. Uh, and this was agreed in principle this time last year by both sides. Uh, and the EU is simply looking for the UK to follow through on that commitment that if there is to be a trade deal that avoids tariffs and quotas, uh, well then there has to be guarantees around fair competition and there has to be a governance model that ensures that if there are disputes in that area in the future, they can be resolved quickly. The second issue then is fish, which is a very emotive, difficult issue for both sides. Uh, and we really have to try and find a way uh, of coming up with a compromise on fish that both sides can live with. And we need to try and dial down the language on this because it's very easy to be emotive uh, and, uh, and raise hackles uh, on this issue. Um, but that makes it much more difficult to get the compromise that we need. Uh, the third issue then isn't, isn't policy at all. Uh, well, it's linked to policy, but it's a legal issue. Uh, and that's uh, even if we do get a new trade deal negotiated between both sides, uh, if the British government uh, is determined to continue with their internal market bill to reintroduce um, parts of that bill that were removed uh, by the House of Lords this week, uh, then I think uh, this is a deal that won't be ratified by the EU because there's no way the EU will agree to ratify a new agreement uh, if the British government uh, is breaking the existing agreement that's not even 12 months old and breaking international law by doing that. So, so there are real obstacles here uh, to, to getting this deal done. But having said that, the cost for everybody of not getting a deal done, I hope will be enough to ensure that both negotiating teams find a way of getting a compromise that they can both live with. Just want to pick up on a couple of the things you said uh, in that answer. Um, firstly, on the internal markets bill. So you're saying that if the UK government reimposes parts of the internal market bill, we're going to have no deal. That's it. Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I've spoken to a lot of EU capitals about this um, and also EU commissioners. Uh, and I think there is an absolutely uh, unanimous view uh, that if the British government deliberately uh, decides to break international law and undermine a treaty that's not even 12 months old, well, then why would the EU sign up to a new deal? Um, when the UK is breaking the existing one um, linked to Brexit. Uh, and I think you know, any logical person uh, listening to that argument uh, uh, surely understands where the EU is coming from here. You know, we have warned against this. Um, the, the EU has said that it'll have to take legal action against the UK if they proceed with breaking international law and undermining the, the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland, which is part of the Brexit withdrawal agreement. But having said that, you know, I think uh, we need to focus less on the legalities of these issues and more on actually resolving the outstanding issues. Because in my view, um, if we can resolve the outstanding issues linked to the protocol on Northern Ireland, uh, if we can get a future relationship agreement in place, well then the issues uh, that the government uh, say they have, uh, that they're dealing with, with the internal market bill, effectively disappear anyway. So let's focus on resolving the outstanding issues. Well, let's talk about uh, one of those other... I think the internal um, market bill may not be the issue that it is now. Well, let's talk about resolving some of the other outstanding issues that you mentioned as well. Fishing, as you say, a very motive uh, issue for many people. There's a report in the Sunday Times uh, saying that Britain wants to reserve at least half of the fish in British waters for UK boats. 
The EU says it should be less than 20%. I mean, it feels like, if that's true, the two sides are an awfully long way away. Are you comfortable risking a no deal and all that it entails to keep French fishermen happy? Well, this isn't about French fishermen. I can assure you it's about Irish fishermen and Dutch fishermen um, and Danish fishermen and Portuguese fishermen. You know, it's about... Uh, it's about EU fishing interests on one side and British fishing interests on the other. Uh, and the truth is uh, that the two sides are very far apart uh, in terms of the expectations on the British side and the negotiating mandate that Michel Barnier has on so the, the EU deal, side. The deal could fall uh, down on fishing. That's correct to say that. It then. could. It could. Uh, it could. I, I certainly hope that won't be the case. It'll be extraordinary if it does. Uh, but I think that is possible. And, you know, if the, if the UK side takes an approach of let's get everything else agreed and then, let, then let's say to the EU, surely we're not going to allow this to collapse on fishing, so give us what we want on fishing, that is a negotiating tactic that won't work. Like everything here, there's a middle ground position that's needed. Uh, and, and the EU argument on this is... So the EU should is, move as well on look, fishing, you think? No, uh, um, no well, well, sorry, the EU has already moved on fishing uh, from its position of trying to hold the status quo, but, but it hasn't moved enough uh, for the UK to be, to be happy. But the way in which the EU sea fish, because it's important that British listeners understand this, you know, the, the UK is looking for facilitation from the EU in many, many areas. Take the energy market, for example. Uh, the UK wants to access the EU energy market. Uh, and the EU says, well, that's fine, we can try to facilitate that, but we want access to British fishing grounds as well. Uh, this is about give and take. Uh, and these fish are, you know, fish don't hold passports. You know, if you take mackerel, for example, which is a big stock that's under discussion here, most of the mackerel caught in Scottish waters are born off the west coast of Ireland, they mature off the northwest coast of Ireland, and then they swim as adults into Scottish waters where they're caught by both EU fleets and British fleets. Uh, these, these fish aren't owned by anybody. They are transitory. They move between jurisdictions. And we're trying now to get a shared arrangement so that we can manage stocks in a way that's sustainable for both sides, uh, okay. so that we can keep fishing interests uh, um, uh, strong, okay. both in the EU and in the UK in the future, and manage the stocks in a sustainable way. But we let are, me be um, clear, without a deal on fish, we won't get a deal. Um, very clear point um, that you've made uh, on that. Uh, we are running out of time, but I'm keen to know when the deadline is for getting uh, a deal. Um, you said last week that if we don't have a deal at some point next week, then we have real problems. Sunday Times reports today a deal could be done the following Monday, the 23rd of November. When is the deadline? Well, I, when I said that if a deal isn't done this week, we have real problems, I meant it. Um, you know, we are running out of time now. Uh, there is a ratification process, particularly on the EU side, that does take some time. The European Parliament has got to pass this. There'll be debates in every capital across the EU. Uh, and, of course, EU leaders have to come together to sign off on any final deal. And once there is a political agreement, if there is a political agreement, bet between the two negotiating teams, which is a big if at this stage, uh, putting together the final legal text of that agreement also takes time. And there's only, what, 46, 47 days left in the year. Um, so this week is, if you want to use sporting parlance, this is move week. You know, we have got to make big progress this week. Hopefully we've got to get the big issues resolved in principle this week so that then we can finalise text and get this deal ratified. You know, I mean, people have got to see the bigger picture here too. Europe and the UK uh, are struggling their way through uh, the COVID uh, virus. Uh, we've got to start looking ahead and creating some optimism and some positivity, building a partnership between the EU and the UK for the future, not acrimony and division uh, and the inability to be able to make uh, the kind of progress that we're trying to make over the next week or so. Okay. Um, so what I would say to, to both sides is the opportunity is there. This is a difficult deal to get done, but it is very doable uh, if the approach is right from both sides. And in my view, uh, the UK government understand only too well what is needed to get agreement this week. Uh, the, UK, or the EU has been absolutely consistent on that for over 12 months now. So let's make this thing uh, move forward this week uh, and start to plan for a new relationship that's based on a positive one rather than a negative one. We'll be putting some of your points directly to uh, George Eustace in just a moment. But just finally, um, there's been some concerning reports that there's been very little progress uh, on a deal uh, this week. Do you think the drama in number 10 has been a distraction? And do you think that 
with the departure of Dominic Cummings and Lee Kane, two key figures in Vote Leave, a trade deal becomes more likely? Well, look, I mean, I think there, of course, have been huge distractions in Number 10 this week, but they're not distractions for the EU. You know, I mean, we've never focused on the personalities when it comes to Brexit. It's always been the issues themselves. Uh, and personalities that's still the matter as well, don't so, they? In a negotiation. They do. They do, of course. But, but that's really a matter for the Prime Minister. Uh, he's the decision maker here for Britain. Um, uh, David Frost is still the key negotiator. Uh, and so, you know, regardless of who is advising the Prime Minister in terms of how to finalise a deal here, which is hopefully the space we'll be in this week, uh, the EU will remain consistent and respectful uh, of Britain. Um, but we also are very firm in terms of the key issues from a, an EU perspective that need to be resolved before we can get a deal here. So regardless of the personalities, uh, we regard that as a, as a British issue. It's a matter for the Prime Minister. Um, but of course, we, we follow events closely. Uh, but really, uh, who advises the British Prime Minister is a matter for the British Prime Minister, not the EU or Ireland. OK, Simon Coveney, thank you very much for coming on the programme this morning. Really interesting to get your thoughts uh, you. on progress on that trade deal. Thank you.